家好。咩大大大家好啊？大家好。<笑>讀你聽嘅時間。讀你聽。Charles Dickens 嘅 Great Expectations。係啦，今日我哋讀 Charles Dickens 嘅 Great Expectations。五十八節。係啦，講到邊啊？講到去啊，做咧好照顧阿 Pip 嘅，又幫佢還債，又照顧佢。點解要照顧阿 Pip 啊？佢係超級好朋友。阿 Pip 病咗啊！係啊。要講阿 P 病咗先得噶嘛，冇<笑>前文後理嘅，成日都講嘢。我唔開心又病咗啦。你要顧下人聽嘅人嘅感受噶嘛，講嘢好冇？好啦，咁誒個故事誒發展到呢個位啦，咁啊。佢想揾阿 B D。點解啊？突然間覺得佢好愛佢啊，好掛住佢啊，想揾佢啦。其實倒不如話佢一字不提呢個 Estella， 然之後就跌埋心水就揾阿 Betty 呢樣嘢，咁咪有少少突兀嘅，我覺得呢度，因為佢完全冇描寫到佢對於 Estella 嗰個死心，嗯，佢一路都冇提到嘅其實，嗯，啊，佢淨係有哀過佢，唔好嫁俾佢個 friend。係咪啊 ？Drama 啊，佢佢要哀佢唔好嫁俾 Drama， 但係佢冇對佢有一種死心嘅嘅過程咯、嗯。而 Dickens 嘅寫嘢手法，佢係會講嘅，但係偏偏佢又冇，然之後就跳咗去 Biddy 嗰度。但係中間佢對 Biddy 有任何思念之情啊，完全冇嘅喎，提都唔提嘅喎，亦都。幾乎冇咩交集，中間試過有一次有啲書信傳遞咁，但係真係都係一啲即係幾個幾幾句大過啦。然之後 ，Biddy 有一次就即係仲質疑阿 Pip 會唔會翻嚟同我哋一齊添啊 ？Pip 仲好 personal， 好好 hurt 添啊，係咁。但係同佢嗰個愛情係完全冇嘅。咁所以係其實係呢度係我覺得有啲突兀嘅嚇。咁但係佢。會唔會刻意咁寫去帶出其他一啲劇情咧？會唔會咁咧？咁即係，但係始終我都係失望啦。對於即係如果佢描寫 Stella 嗰一 part， 即係其實佢一路都留咗好多窿窿喺度，冇交代，反而喺度寫 Oliver 啊，寫佢同阿 Jo 啊，唔係好常知嘅其實。不過唔緊要啦，好嘛？我哋繼續睇啦 ，Chapter Fifty Eight， 好嘛？嗯。The tidings of my high fortunes having had a heavy fall, had got down to my native place in this neighbourhood before I got there. I found a blue boar in possession of the intelligence, and I found that it made a great change in the boar's demeanour. Whereas the boar had cultivated my good opinion with warm assiduity when I was coming into property, the boar. Was exceedingly cool on the subject now that I was out of the going out of property. The boar, 即係應該係佢以前住過嗰個地方。佢開始咪同阿 Herbert 租間房嘅嗰度。即係佢係佢係一個 lodge 嚟嘅。佢即係佢樓下我諗係餐廳啊、bar 啊啲咩啦，啲 local pub 咁樓上咁樣住。It was evening when I arrived, much fatigued by the journey I had so often made so easily. The boar could not put me into my usual bedroom, which was engaged, and could only assign me a very indifferent chamber among the pigeons and post chaises of the yard. But I had as sound a sleep in that lodging as in the most superior accommodation the boar could have given me. And the quality of my dreams was about the same as in the best bedroom. Early in the morning, while my breakfast was getting ready, I strolled round by Sally's house. Sally's house 就係邊個啊 ？Estella 嘛。There were printed bills on the gate and on bits of carpet hanging out of the windows, announcing a sale by auction of the household furniture and effects next week. The house itself was to be sold as old building materials and pulled down. 
Lot 1 was marked in whitewashed knock knee letters on the brew house. Lot 2 on that part of the main building, which had been so long shut up. Other lots were marked off on other parts of the structure, and the ivy had been torn down to make room for the inscriptions, and much of it trailed low in dust and was withered already. Stepping in for a moment at the open gate, and looking around me with the uncomfortable air of a stranger who had no business there, I saw the auctioneer's clerk walking on the casks and telling them off for the information of the catalogue and parlour, pen in hand, who made temporary desks of the wheelchair I had so often pushed along to the tune of old Clem. When I got back to my breakfast in the Boar's coffee room, I found Mr. Pumblecook conversing with the landlord. Mr. Pumblecook was waiting for me and addressed me in the following terms. Young man, I'm sorry to see you brought low, but what else could be expected? What else could be expected? As he extended his hand with a magnificently forgiving air, and as I was broken by illness and unfit to quarrel, I took it. William, said Mr. Pumblecook to the waiter, put a muffin on the table. And has it come to this? Has it come to this? I frowningly sat down to my breakfast. Mr. Pumblecook stood over me and poured out my tea before I could touch the teapot with the air of a benefactor who was resolved to be true at the last. William, said Mr. Pumblecook mournfully, put a salt on in happier times, addressing me. I think you took sugar and did you take milk? You did, sugar and milk. William, bring a watercress. Thank you, said I shortly, but I don't eat watercresses. You don't eat them, returned Mr. Pumblecook, sighing and nodding his head several times, as if he might have expected that, and as if abstinence from watercresses were consistent with my downfall. True, the simple fruits of the earth. No, you needn't bring any, William. I went on with my breakfast, and Mr. Pumblecook continued to stand over me, staring fishly and breathing noisily, as he always did. Little more than skin and bone, mused Mr. Pumblecook aloud. And yet when he went from here and I spread afore him my humble store, like the bee, he was as plump as a peach. This reminded me of the wonderful difference between the servile manner in which he had offered his hand in my new prosperity, saying, May I? And the ostentatious clemency with which he had just now exhibited the same fat five fingers. Ha! he went on, handing me the brown button. And ere you are going to Joseph. In heaven's name, said I, firing in spirit of myself. What does it matter to you where I'm going? Leave that teapot alone. It was the worst course I could have taken, because it gave Pumble Cook the opportunity he wanted. Yes, young man, said he, releasing a hand over the article in question, retiring a step or two from my table, and speaking for a behoof of the landlord and waiter at the door. I will leave the teapot alone. You are right, young man. For once, you are right. I forgive myself when I take such an interest in your breakfast as to wish your frame, exhausted by the debilitating effects of pro prodigality, to be stimulated by the awesome nourishment of your forefathers. And yet, said Pumblecook, turning to the landlord and waiter and pointing me out at arm's length, this is him as I ever sported within his days of happy infancy. Tell me not it cannot be. I tell you, this is him. A low murmur from the two replied. The waiter appeared to be particularly affected. This is him, said Pumblecook, as I have rolled in my shade cart. This is him, as I have seen brought up by hand. This is him untold, a sister of which I was uncle by Mary. And as her name was Georgiana Maria from her own mother, let him deny it if he can. The waiter seemed convinced that I could not deny it, and that it gave the case a black look. Young man, said Pumblecook, screwing his head at me in the old fashion, you are going to Joseph. What does it matter to me, you ask me, where you are going? I say to you, sir, you are going to Joseph. The waiter coughed as if he modestly invited me to get over that. Now, said Pumblecook, and all this with the most exaggerating air of saying in the course of good virtue what was perfectly convincing and conclusive. I will tell you what to say to Joseph. He is squires of the ball present, known and respected in this town. And here is William, which his father's name was Potkins, if I do not deceive myself. 
You do not, sir," said William. "In their presence," pursued Pumblechook. "I will tell you, young man, what to say to Joseph." Says you, Joseph. I have this day seen my earliest benefactor and the founder of my fortunes. I will name no names, Joseph, but so they are pleased to call him up town, and I have seen that man. I swear I don't see him here," said I. "Say that likewise," retorted Pumblechook. "Say you sat there, and even Joseph will probably betray surprise." There you quite mistake him," said I. "I know better." Says you, Pumblechook went on. "Joseph, I have seen that man, and that man bears you no malice and bears me no malice. He knows your character, Joseph, and is well acquainted with your pig-headedness and ignorance. And he knows my character, Joseph, and he knows my want of gratitude." "Yes, Joseph," says you. Here, Pumblechook shook his head and hand at me. "He knows my total deficiency of common human gratitude." He knows it, Joseph, as none can. You do not know it, Joseph, having to call to know it. But that man do. Windy donkey as he was, it really amazed me that he could have the face to talk thus to mine. Says you, Joseph. He gave me a little message, which I will now repeat. It was that in my being brought low, he saw the finger of providence. He knew that finger when he saw Joseph, and he saw it plain. It pointed out this writing, Joseph. Reward of ingratitude to his earliest benefactor and founder of fortunes, but that man said he did not repent of what he had done. Joseph, not at all. It was right to do it. It was kind to do it. It was benevolent to do it, and he would do it again. It's pity," said I scornfully, as I finished my interrupted breakfast, "that the man did not say what he had done and would do again." Squires of the ball, Pumblecook was now addressing the landlord and William. I have no objections to your mentioning. Either uptown or downtown, if such should be your wishes, that it was right to do it, kind to do it, benevolent to do it, and that I would do it again. With those words, the impostor shook him both by the hand with an air and left the house, leaving me much more astonished than delighted by the virtues of the same indefinite it. I was not long after him in leaving the house too, and when I went down the high street, I saw him holding forth at his shop door to a select group. Who honoured me with very unfavourable glances as I passed on the opposite side of the way, but it was only the pl- pleasanter to turn to Biddy and to Joe, whose great forbearance shone more brightly than before, if that could be, contrasted with this brazen pretender. I went towards them slowly, for my limbs were weak, but with a sense of increasing relief as I drew nearer to them, and a sense of leaving arrogance and untruthfulness further and further behind. The June weather was delicious. The sky was blue. The larks were soaring high over the green corn. I thought all that countryside more beautiful and peaceful by far than I had ever known it to be yet. Many pleasant pictures of the life and that I would lead hit there, and of the change for the better that would come over my character when I had a gui- guiding spirit at my side, whose simple faith and clear home wisdom had proved beguiled my way. They awakened a tender emotion in me. For my heart was softened by my return, and such a change had come to pass that I felt like one who was toiling home barefoot from distant travel and whose wanderings had lasted many years. The schoolhouse where Biddy was mistress I had never seen, but a little roundabout lane by which I entered the village, for quietness' sake, took me past it. I was disappointed to find that the day was a holiday; no children were there, and Biddy's house was closed. Some hopeful notion of seeing her. Busily engaged in her daily duties before she saw me, had been in my mind and was defeated. But the forge was a very short distance off, and I went towards it under the sweet green limes, listening for the clink of Joe's hammer. Long after I ought to have heard it, and long after I had fancied I heard it and found it, but a fancy, all was still. The limes were there, and the white thorns were there, and the chestnut trees were there, and the leaves rustled harmoniously when I stopped to listen. But a clink of Joe's hammer was not in the midsummer's wind. Almost fearing, without knowing why, to come in view of the forge, I saw it at last, and saw that it was closed. No gleam of fire, no glittering shower of sparks, no roar of bellows, all shut up and still. But the house was not deserted, and the best parlour seemed to be in use, for there were white curtains fluttering in its window, and the window was open and gay with flowers. I went softly towards it. Meaning to peep over the flowers, when Joe and Biddy stood before me, arm in arm. At first, Biddy gave a cry, as if she thought it was my apparition. 
But in another moment, she was in my embrace. I wept to see her, and she wept to see me, because she looked so fresh and pleasant. She, because I looked so worn and white. But dear Biddy, how smart you are! Yes, dear Pip. And Joe, how smart you are! Yes, dear old Pip, old chap. I looked at both of them, from one to the other, and then, "It's my wedding day!" cried Biddy in a burst of happiness, and I'm married to Joe. They had taken me into the kitchen, and I had laid my head down to the old deal table. Biddy held one of my hands to her lips, and Joe's restoring touch was on my shoulder, which she weren't strong enough, my dear, for her to be surprised," said Joe. And Biddy said, "I ought to have thought of it, dear Joe, but I was too happy." They were both so overjoyed to see me, so proud to see me, so touched by my coming to them, so delighted that I should have come by accident to make their day complete. My first thought was one of great thankfulness that I had never breathed this last breath of hope to Joe. How often, while he was with me in my illness, had it risen to my lips? How irrevocable would have been his knowledge of it if he had remained with me but another hour? Dear Biddy," said I, "you have the best husband in the whole world, and if you could have seen him by my bed, you would have. But no, you couldn't love him better than you do. No, I couldn't indeed," said Biddy. "And dear Joe, you have the best wife in the whole world, and she will make you as happy as even you deserve to be. You dear, good, noble Joe." He looked at me with a quivering lip, and fairly put his sleeves before his eyes. And Joe and Biddy both, as you have been to church today, and are in charity and love with all mankind, receive my humble thanks for you, for all you have done for me, and all I have so ill repaid. And when I say that I am going away within an hour, for I am soon going abroad, and that I shall never rest until I have worked for the money with which you have kept me out of prison and have sent it to you, don't think, dear Joe and Biddy. That if I could repay it a thousand times over, I suppose I could cancel a farthing of the debt I owe you, or that I would do so if I could. They were both melted by these words, and both entreated me to say no more. But I must say more, dear Joe. I hope you will have children to love, and that some little fellow who sits in this chimney corner of a winter night, who may remind you of another little fellow gone, gone out of it for ever. Don't tell him, Joe, that I was thankless. Don't tell him, Billy, that I was ungenerous and unjust. Only tell him that I honoured you both, because you were both so good and true, and that, as your child, I said it would be natural to him to grow up a much better man than I did. I ain't going," said Joe from behind his sleeve. To tell him nothing of that nature, Pip. Nor Billy ain't, nor yet no one ain't. And now. Though I know you have already done it in your own kind hearts, pray tell me both that you forgive me. Pray let me hear you say the words that I may carry the sound of them away with me, and then I shall be able to believe that you can trust me and think better of me in the time to come. Oh dear old Pip, old chap," said Joe. "God knows as I forgive you, if I have anything to give, to forgive." Amen. And God knows I do," echoed Billy. Now let me go up and look at my little old little room, and rest there a few minutes by myself. And then, when I have eaten and drunk with you, go with me as far as the finger post, dear Joe and Biddy, before we say goodbye. I sold all I had and put aside as much as I could for a composition with my creditors, who gave me ample time to pay them in full. And I went out and joined Herbert. Within a month, I had quitted England. Within two months, I was clerk to Clerker and Co. And within four months, I assumed my first undivided responsibility, for the beam across the parlour ceiling at Mill Pond Bank, and then ceased to tremble under Old Barley's scowls, and was at peace. And Herbert had gone away to marry Clara, and I was left in sole charge of the Eastern Branch until he brought her back. Many a year went round before I was a partner in the house, but I lived happily with Herbert and his wife. And lived frugally, and paid my debts, and maintained a constant correspondence with Biddy and Joe. It was not until I became third in the firm that Clarica betrayed me to Herbert, but he then declared that the secret of Herbert's partnership had been long enough upon his conscience, and he must tell it. So he told it, and Herbert was as much moved as amazed, and the dear fellow and I were not the worst friends for the long concealment. I must not leave it to be supposed that we were ever a great house, or that we made mints of money. 
We were not in a grand way of business, but we had a good name and worked for our profits and did very well. We owed so much to Herbert's ever cheerful industry and readiness that I often wondered how I had conceived that old idea of his ineptitude until it was until I was one day enlightened by the reflection that perhaps the ineptitude had never been in him at all, but had been in me. Jumdim. 其實都係都係交代劇情啦，主要，但係佢重點就係佢去揾 Biddy， 但係 Biddy。我上次已經估到喎，都有諗下會唔會係咁咧。嗯，都好都好 fitting 啦，但係都係都係突然啦，即係個時間無端好似撥得快咗好多咁啦。咁呢個係佢嘅佢嘅手法啦，嚇、啊，即係。咁但係如果你交代劇情，你你就唔好描寫啦。佢又有嘢，佢要描寫下啲嘢，要又要寫一大段《Pumble Girl》，即係我覺得好無謂咯。嗯，即係佢其實佢好多篇幅走去寫《Pumble Girl》啊，即係講啊，你而家變成咁啊，誒當日都係因為我啊，即係佢都仲係喺度，仲喺度做緊嗰，仲喺度講嗰啲嘢，仲喺度拉關係。咁然之後佢對住啊～ Jo 同 Biddy 講啲嘢，啊，其其實都，我只覺得唔算好 appropriate 啊，我自己覺得啊，因為佢第一句對住兩個佢，你娶咗全世界最好嘅、嗯，即係佢始終都係喺度 make 一個 judgement 咯、嗯。雖然呢個係一個好嘅説話，但係俾我感覺都係。有啲即係都係一個 judgement 咯，即係佢喺度佢喺度拎一個 judging 嘅 comment 咯。雖然係一個 compliment 嚇、嗯啊，即係佢始終都係將自己擺喺一個高啲嘅位置去去評論人。雖然佢係讚人咁咯、嗯。我覺得我覺得佢始終都係將即係你。你當你評論人嘅時候，你好多時候都係將自己擺喺一個稍為較高啲嘅位置。可能係第三嗯。即係外人嘅眼睛都得。係啊，但係佢佢嗰個 wording 咧，佢嗰、那個即係佢一嚟就係話，佢唔會話啊，我真係戥你開心，唔係咯。佢、嗯、話：哦，佢係最好啊、嗯！你明唔明白？即係誒、嗯，我覺得有少少。係好發自佢內心嘅，但係真係冇修飾咯，係啊，甚至乎有啲，即係如果你一一個比較敏鋭啲人，會覺得有輕微不禮貌，我自己覺得。嗯、但係又又真係好確曬佢內心嘅説話，但係其實聽落係係有少少難，少少難嘅，少少難嘅，因為佢。咁，然之後就佢亦都冇描寫到佢嗰種尷尬啦，都冇啦，亦<笑>都亦都冇寫到佢同 Biddy 傾多幾句都冇啦。唔係佢，我以為佢話想入房幾分鐘，佢會有啲嘢諗下冇。唔係佢上房休息啫。係咯，咁啊瞓陣啦。咁然之後個時間就個鐘就無端撥咗一一一年後啦。咁佢同 Herbert 嗰啲嘢其實都～算啦，冇乜所謂，都唔係都唔係啲咩重點啦。即係 Herbert 究竟最尾知唔知道知道咗咯？話俾你聽咯，你哋賺到啲錢咯，咪 lift you go 嚟咯。即係意思即係咩啊？即係節約係咯，節約咯，係咪啊？咁咯，還清啲債咯。咁但係點解完全唔提 Estella 咧？即係你你可以唔提佢嘅人，但係你要提佢你嗰個內心嗰、那個。轉變啊嘛，你諗起佢啊，或者你你你點樣？佢都隻字不提喎、啊，咁你哋反咗面咩？係<笑>咪？又或者點解你唔提莊模咧？你連潘布局都咁多篇幅佢講啦，咁點解唔可以提一提莊模咧？或者哦，我透過 Herbert 聽到關於莊模同 Estella 嘅消息都可以㗎，但係完全唔提喎、啊。可能，咁佢就令到個故事就少咗一個好重要。嘅一個 point 就係一直以嚟推動住阿 Pip 
要上樓，就係、是、因為 Stella。其中之好大原因。咁但係，咁而家散曬咯。而家變咗將件事變咗一堆激情啊！就係佢同阿 Profit 嘅激情啦。咩激情？然之後就係佢同阿 Jo 嘅激情四射啦，係咪先？即係同阿 Jo 啊攬頭攬計，係咪？跟住又同 Herbert 攬頭攬計。就又中間仲要加多個誒呢、呃這個呢、這個誒 Wemic 又攬頭攬計，全部男人嚟嘅攬頭攬計。咁你呢個故，但係呢啲故事唔係講呢啲嘢噶嘛，唔係講男人之間嘅情義啊嘛，你係講遠大前程啊嘛。點解你要走到咁遠？就係、是、因為一個女人。嗯。但係你竟然完全唔交代。咁好啦，而家剩返，以我所知，剩返兩節啦，一至兩節啦，其實都好短嘅。拉屎！咁即係你，你拖到呢度先至講，即係我就覺得，唉，爭咁啲。我唔理你最尾點樣收啦，始終都係爭啲，因為呢幾 part 我覺得係無意義，比較上。我覺得佢之前又唔得閒睇。其實都無意義，你甚至乎可以將個時空。收窄啲都仲得，直接就跳去 Stella 嗰度咪完咯。嗰度佢就係唔想講 Stella。即係你而家中間呢度塞呢堆咁嘅嘢，其實即係你覺得唉，通即係唔係好重要咯呢啲嘢。變咗第二個故事。你用一個大篇幅交代曬得㗎啦，其實佢都其實唔重要嘅呢啲嘢，係咪？點解感覺有少少好似單曬成啲感覺？咁又冇咁差，但係即係有少少失望。即係佢到而家都係隻字不提阿 Stella， 佢甚至乎淨提埋佢咗 Sally's house 嘅，咁但係 Sally's house 要拆，咁你都可以提一提啊！我諗起佢啊咩咩，唔講啊，完全唔講啦，直接就阿 Jo 啦。佢突然間又好唔，可能佢想表達到佢已經冇乜感情啦呢種。咁但係個轉折係咩咧？係咪你要講噶嘛？但係 anyway， 算啦。我哋下次繼續啦，好唔好？拜、okay. 拜。